Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world listening to the DB2 Night Show. This is show number uh, Z89 or Z89, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, it's uh, another great show, another great day here in Toronto, where I am, and uh, I've got my special guest today is Adrian Burke of the uh, DB2 SWAT team out of the IBM Silicon Valley Lab. How are you today, Adrian? Hey, Martin. Doing pretty good. It's still summer in Texas, but we're getting there. Great. Great. Yeah, we are having that this weekend. We're getting up to 85 degrees. The, the cool heater is on, and uh, I'm going to be filling it up with grandchildren, hopefully uh, today, tomorrow, or the next day, or all three days. Everyone is welcome when they come to our house. So it's just going to be a, a really uh, one of our last big summer uh, pool party type things. With that in mind, uh, let's move along and talk about today's show and the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, once again, here's our uh, our uh, Twitter information and LinkedIn group. Uh, please follow us. We announce things about the show, including upcoming shows, and uh, we look forward to your participation. And uh, gone through and tried to make all the the big V's, little V's. It seems to take some time to do that, but we're working our best on it. And here's our disclaimer. Sometimes I've read this in the past. Today, I am not going to do so, uh, simply because I think you've all heard it before. You can certainly, it's up there long enough that you can read it. And uh, the main thing is we are recording it. We will make replays available. And today, uh, we have a special bonus for you. In the handout section, you will notice that Adrian's slides are provided during the show, so you can follow along on the screen and read the slides later. Uh, we'll also make the slides available on the replay blog along with our standard uh, recording of my wonderful voice uh, and Adrian's presentation as uh, uh, in both uh, both formats we've been using through the years. So with that, uh, there we'll do some of uh, the announcements which we're doing, we'll do some polls, then we'll move on to uh, Adrian's presentation. Uh, just to let you know about upcoming shows. Next month, we have uh, Julian Stewer of uh, Triton in the UK. Uh, I asked him to send me his topic, and unfortunately, I did not receive that in time to uh, put it in the slide deck. And uh, uh, But uh, that will be announced shortly online. Please look for it and, uh, and hold the dates. Uh, we also, uh, our next uh, C show will be on the 16th of November. Again, I have not yet lined up the speaker for that. I expect it will be somebody from IBM. Uh, we like to have uh, a mixture of IBM uh, uh, independent consultants, especially gold consultants, because those guys know what they're talking about. And uh, we also have uh, other vendors as well. But we expect that we'll uh, I'll be looking for an IBM speaker for that slot. And on December 14th, we have Christian Malero, who has speak, spoken before. He also has agreed to present, but he has not yet given me his topic. And uh, lastly, but not least, is myself on the LUW side of the house. I'll be uh, doing a presentation, so I thought I'd advertise that. Uh, I'll be speaking on indexes uh, versus prefetch and how to win the fight between those two things. Also, at the end of the month for uh, DBI, our founding sponsor of the uh, DB2 Night Show, uh, they'll be doing uh, one of their informative webinars regarding their, their tools, and they'll be doing on, that on Friday, the 28th of September, after the uh, LUW show on that date. So if you've not seen that presentation, it's uh, slick, and it uh, shows you how to save a lot of money on DB2 LUW tuning. Our standard sponsors are these uh, fine folks, as always. Uh, Klaus Brandt helps us with mailing. Uh, we, of course, work with I. I Doug and Triton, uh, as well of course uh, DBI and myself at the bottom there. And we don't do commercials on this on the on the Z show. We just tell you who's uh, helped make it possible for this show to be here. And I thought I would share with you, uh, seeing as we did have a summer vacation to watch replays, I thought I'd show you how I spent my summer. I, I had a wonderful trip over to uh, Bergen, Norway. Uh, this. One thing about uh, DB2, when I first got into uh, working for vendors back in uh, 1988, golly, long ago, uh, uh, my boss at the time said to me, learn DB2 and see the world. And uh, at the time, he was sending me all over the United States, and he sent me to England. But 
uh, truer words were never spoken. Uh, I've been to Norway several times before. This is my third trip to Bergen, but uh, I went over and taught a uh, DB2 for Z application design class in Bergen and had a wonderful uh, 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 six to seven days there. And I actually had a, a bit of time to go sightseeing. So the house in the upper left hand corner belongs to um, um, Edvard Grieg, who is a very famous composer uh, of uh, Norwegian music. And he actually uh, it was very interesting learning the history of, of how his music influenced the independence of Norway. Uh, quite a quite a moving experience, actually, in many regards. The second picture there is the little harbor on which the, uh, the my customer's uh, office building is located. There's people living. It's more uh, mixed residential commercial use, as you might say, with a marina in front of it. So it was a rather spectacular spot. And uh, on the way home, I had a chance to stop into Iceland. And uh, what you see is a picture of yours truly standing in front of the geyser basin. Uh, uh, it's actually named Geyser because the, uh, the very first geyser was discovered there about a thousand years ago where they had water shooting in the air. They thought that was cool. They gave it a name like that. It means basically water shooting in the air, and the place is named that as well. Of course, if you're in, in America and you haven't made a trip to Yellowstone, uh, Old Faithful is uh, exactly that. Every, every hour it goes off, pretty much they can predict when it's going to do that, so you can make a good home movie of the... Um, or video of the uh, of uh, Old Faithful. This one is kind of high. It pops up and goes off for all of about uh, 10 or 15 seconds, and then it goes away. It does that every 10 minutes. So, but uh, it's always a bit of a surprise, and it's harder to get on video. Okay. With that, it's time to move on and talk about our polling questions, or do our polling questions for today. So, I'll put the first one up here. Uh, What's the, uh, what's the latest version of DB2 uh, that you're running in your shop? You notice I've updated this a little bit. I've got um, uh, version 10 or earlier now. I've gotten rid of the version 9 stuff. Uh, and I've also moved on to which uh, function level you have in, in, uh, in uh, DB2.12. And uh, with that, we've uh, gone about 30 seconds. We've got our audience up to 62%, 64%, 7%, 7, nearly 70%. I like to get to 75 if we can. If not, I'll close it anyway in about 45 seconds. And uh, I'll share that result with you. And there we are. We've reached about that number. So let me share the result of that poll with you. And uh, you notice that uh, we still have some people are, are couple of stragglers on version 10, but almost everyone's on DB211. We do have some people on uh, uh, DB212, so that's good to see. Okay, we'll move on and do the next poll, which is uh, what other DBM, DBMSs do you have besides uh, besides DB21C? Assuming anybody listening to a DB2 um, a Z presentation would have Z installed. Here we have uh, people able to choose more than one, and we still uh, have all sorts of things going on out there. This is kind of fun. And, uh, as expected, uh, we've got uh, an awful lot of people voting. The votes are coming in quicker this time. And we are up to uh, an acceptable number to report our, our uh, results to you, and we notice that Nearly 75% of our audience has DB2LUW, and then we have uh, all the other players, and we still have vSAM and lots of IMS out there. And that's good to see. Like We like the IBM stuff, don't we? All right, let's hide that, and we'll move on. And we'll, Now we're going to do the uh, show-specific questions for you. The first one is, uh, uh, what's the, your largest singer size of your largest single buffer pool. Now, uh, for those people that like to uh, uh, know what frames are to pages or the size of, of the buffer pool, uh, one million frames is less than less than four gigabytes. And uh, you notice uh, that the sizes go up rather uh, remarkably after that, greater than four uh, gigabytes, greater than 40 gigabytes, greater than 400 gigabytes in buffer pools. You know, Adrian, I remember back in the days when uh, 
my first uh, DB2 V1 R1, uh, I had 10 megabytes to spread across three buffer pools. Things have changed a lot since then, haven't they? Huh. Okay. Let's, Unfortunately, uh, there's still customers with. I know there's one 10 guy, meg there's in one production. Guy, yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, there's one one uh, uh, a client of mine that, where the, uh, the the guy in charge of system tuning says we have lots of disk cache, so we don't need main memory cache. And uh, we've tried to hitting him over the head with sticks and try to do other things to uh, get him to change that, and he just will not. Okay, there we got that one done. We still have some people that uh, don't work on that side of the house, so they might they don't have the answer. Uh, here's the next one. Now it's the largest size of your biggest buffer pool, and this is uh, now to gigabytes as opposed to frames. And uh, I had to change the greater than and less than symbols to less than and greater than because uh, Go to webinar doesn't like those. Uh, they think consider those special characters. I guess they can interfere with their HTML. And here we have, uh, um, this is kind of an interesting result. Um, I'll share this momentarily with people. We've got uh, getting up to the uh, required or a decent sample size. And uh, we'll close that and share it. And we see that uh, we don't have anybody over 100, um, 100 gigabytes in size, or sorry, just a couple. And it seems that everybody's either uh, less than 10 or less than 100 gigs, or they don't know. Okay, moving on, and uh, uh, this is uh, new features in DB2, just to uh, get an idea of what people have done uh, to date. We use the, D the DB2 buffer pool simulation, and uh, this is uh, another one of these interesting numbers. This is why people come on, because they uh, want to learn something new. And uh, we'll close that and share the results. And people have tested this new feature. Uh, an awful lot haven't, and some are using it in production, just a, just a few people. Okay, and one last question. Have you used the auto size feature? Got a, of course, we've got some people voting on this. And we are up to nearly the requisite votes. Thanks for voting quickly. It allows us to get on with our show. And, uh, votes are still coming in. And I think we are done there at 75% voted. So I'll share that one. So we've got people that have tested it. Uh, and we've got uh, only a few that are using it uh, regularly or in production. And we have 70% uh, don't know. That's fine, too. So let me hide that, and uh, I hope you're seeing my screen again. Is that a true statement, Adrian? I'm seeing your PowerPoint presentation. Good, because uh, the next thing to do is put your face up there, and there you are in your nice uniform with a big smile. That's great. And uh, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to you, and you are now going to be the presenter. As soon as I find your... Uh, smiling link here. There we are. And uh, now we should see your screen in just a minute. And there you are. All right. Um, take her away. I'll be watching the uh, Q&A um, thing. If people have questions, please, uh, uh, please make sure that you put them into the uh, and I will follow that, and I will ask Adrian questions as we go through the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I'll try to complete these slides within the hour, but if we run over a little bit, please forgive me, and we can always go back to the, uh, the webinar on the replay. So don't just play in the pool, own it. This is sort of a throwback to, I don't know, what you might hear in, in boot camp or officer school as far as, you know, taking hold of this and taking charge or ownership of it and, and kind of learning along the way. But for pool tuning is, is certainly um, somewhat of an art form and it's definitely iterative. So if at first you don't succeed, you know, try again. Um, and while Martin was, was discussing, I had to throw in um, a picture.
picture of my own here. So um, this is my last trip, which is in Mexico City with a second line manager and a colleague from Rocket Software. And that's how I traveled across central Mexico, it was in the back of a small SUV. So speaking of buffer pool and sizing, um, we were right at the point of paging in the back of that car. Uh, so we do get to travel a bit with IBM, um, but it's certainly not in first class. Moving on. So what would you guys come here to talk about? Buffer pool tuning. So we'll talk a little bit where we're at uh, today, hopefully where you folks are at, kind of level set the field. And we'll talk about some thresholds and tuning and quite a few customer scenarios. So I try to base everything I have and most of the graphics on actual customer data, um, you know, leaving the, the guilty or the innocent party out just so I'm not making up numbers. Moving on. So the first one is a, sort of a disclaimer. So it's all relative, right? If I've um, got a customer that's got, you know, a certain size buffer pool doing 100,000 get pages a second or somebody doing a million get pages a second, which one's better off? Right, we're all doing a thousand IOs per second. Um, is one better or worse? Maybe one's real storage constrained because of other things in the system. So one of the buffer pools is quite a bit larger than the other one. I've I use the thousand IOs per second stat because I've I've heard it thrown around in some of the um, consulting and tuning community as sort of a frame of reference. Um, but of course, our frames of reference change over time and certainly cross release. So my point here is that the key for you guys is to start in your own environment. So you're really just competing against yourself, uh, trying to benchmark where you're at today and how you're improving. And that's certainly you know, what your management is gonna look at. So that's what we're gonna try to look at in this scenario, or this presentation is going kind of before and after, like I said, the, the iterative approach. The key in your environment though, is to understand what knobs to tune, as well as if you're offered the opportunity to increase storage or do any tuning that you know what your next step is going to be and prepared. Because the last thing you want to do is hesitate when they offer you, you know, another 10 gig for DB2. So let's start off um, on the right foot. Uh, in the interest of full transparency, ZPARMs in DB2 are certainly not best practice. So we'll go ahead and, go ahead and throw that out there. Um, in the DB2 lab, we haven't done much on the ZPARMs for buffer pools in several releases. If I look at the defaults that we give you in the ZPARMs, we inherently create pollution. And by pollution, I mean co-locating catalog directory objects and user objects. We'll talk about why that could be you know, a negative effect on which side a little later on. But if you look over here at the VP sizes, VP0 is the largest of 20,000 buffers. Why did we do that? If you remember in version eight, we pushed everything over to Unicode. And then we, in version 10, we put everything to almost everything to universal table space. So that was the one that we increased for you, but the rest of them have sadly fallen behind, especially if you look down at the BP32K with a default of 250 buffers. That is probably too small in any customer environment today. If you look at the course over time, what we've done with catalog directory objects, how we've moved them around to larger page sizes. Over there on the right side, I've got XML table spaces. We've got roles and trusted context. We've got the definition for um, store procedures and 16K buffer pool. And the 32K, we've got things like SPT01, right? Directory objects critical to execution of your packages. So as I mentioned, 250 is, is far too small. What we see a lot of times in customer scenarios today is that that 32K buffer is the one with the highest IO activity. So how do I know if I've got buffer pool pollution? Well, uh, if you skip down to the end of the appendix in this presentation, I give you a, a query that goes against the catalog, against this table space, and you pull out the results that can fit in this chart on the right-hand side. So this is typical of what we see at a customer. You'll see I've got BP0 up there. We've got indexes that are user. We've got indexes that are catalog and indexes that are directory, and those table space is the same. So if you look in the table type, uh, the query will put C for catalog, D for directory, and W for, for work file. And as you noticed in here, the number of pages and objects associated with this buffer pool generally far outweigh the number that are in catalog and directory. So we've got a lot of pollution or other objects in here. Now granted, some of these may be vendor tools or other IBM tools um, that you've put in like Omega Mon or something for a tuning tool where his objects are in there. And that's okay. Um, but generally speaking, we want certainly to segregate catalog directory and user objects. 
And that's because the catalog directory, for the most part, all have a fixed access path. So there's not going to be a whole bunch of difference operating over time, aside from maybe the size of the objects. But your objects are obviously open to changing access paths for various reasons. And having those in a separate buffer pool can help you at least monitor those. Here's my good example in the 32K buffer pool. We've got almost 2 million, 2 million pages of objects that can go through this pool, which is you know, for about 400 times larger than what we have in the catalog and directory. So when we see this as the highest sync IO rate in the entire subsystem, we know that they're not breaking them out. So once again, who cares? Well, if we're talking about migration jobs, having user objects in there would certainly, can certainly hinder things like migration. Um, rebinds, DDL, grant revoke, and other things for doing heavy catalog access, um, especially if you went through a mass auto bind or something. On the flip side, if you've got catalog directory objects bogging down other buffer pools, you may hinder things like recovery time. If you're doing several objects that you have to recover, you know, at the worst time during the online day. And then we'll talk about space growth as well as CPU concerns as we move forward. So lobs, large objects. This pollution goes along with catalog and directory pollution because obviously our catalog and directory uses large objects. Um, and large objects in any buffer pool can be disrupted. So generally, even slobs or small large objects are referenced infrequently. Um, there's a max of one row per page, so you may be wasting a bunch of space. Or if it's a large lob, you can go over multiple pages, but we can only prefetch them in at about 32 pages at a time. So with lobs, you get a bunch of disruption. So beyond just that, for IO, starting version nine, we lost the granularity of the lob lock. So we re reduced lob locking substantially going to version nine. What we do, especially for instance, in a data sharing environment, we're gonna rely on the read LSN or read log sequence number the longest running UR in that group buffer pool, which is obviously group wide in the data sharing group, we rely on that read LSN to tell us the last running unit of work. And if I'm doing any kind of DML up against that lob object, I can't get any space reuse unless I know that I'm not going to interfere with that oldest running unit of recovery or unit of work. So hence, we lose space reuse for deleted lobs if I'm doing updates, which is an insert and a delete, or inserts especially. And we've taken several APARs in this. We discovered this ourselves in version 10 because we had large objects in the catalog directory and we weren't registering our commit scope against syslog range X. And hence, we had customer user objects that were in our buffer pools who, for instance, blew out a 64 gig partition with only 10 rows in it because we weren't allowing them to use space. So some of this, is in the past. We've attacked a lot of the space reuse issues, but it is still there. They will definitely, your large objects will grow if there's long running units of work in there. On the flip side of that, how can lobs have a negative effect on other units of work? Well, if you have an auxiliary table space, an aux index, or static sensitive scrollable cursors, mixing with other objects in a buffer pool, it can cause issues because the longest running unit of work in there has to go up and update that read LSN value. And he does that by communicating with a coupling facility and specifically the SCA structure. So we've got X XCS messages going back and forth on this for every time the oldest unit of work changes in there. And in a data sharing group, aside from those objects, anybody doing inserts not just against lobs, but any inserts, have to go and get that lock to understand where they are kind of in the commit scope. And because of that, we had customers that saw expansive L lock growth in the class two suspense time, or excuse me, class three suspense time. And it was bad enough that they were missing some of their SLAs, and hence we took that APAR PI 78061. That's to do with the MBA lock, which is how we lock the SCA structure. And basically that that APAR removed this update uh, of that lock structure out of the commit scope. So hence, we'll do it asynchronously in the, in the engine, but that's still CPU, right? And obviously, if we're going back and forth to the, the CS structure, it's synchronous. 
Now, version 12 down here at the bottom is going to help you vastly with a much more granular um, read LSN and commit LSN. We go out to the, the top or worst 500 objects now. So that's a vast improvement. So are you in this boat? Well, here's a little query at the bottom. Go out and see if you've got buffer pools that contain lob objects. The ideal scenario is to have anything lob, all lobs in their own pool, and tune it that way and kind of get them out of the way so they don't throw confusion to the rest of the mix. Next one. Well, I scared you enough, hopefully, with the unpollution. So how do I get there? How do I move these objects around? Well, back in version 10, we offered you an online immediate alter function. So you alter the table space, buffer pool, and change the buffer pool. Certainly this doesn't work if you're gonna to try to change page size or seg size or any other of the pending alters. It's immediate only if you change from same size, same size buffer pools. And we do this basically with a, instead of your stop and then alter the object and start again, we'll do it immediately by basically draining the object of all updaters, readers, writers. We'll drive the close and we'll even do the cast out and stuff for you on the group buffer pool. The only downside, which came out after GA through the maintenance stream, was that we now take an X mode lock on the skeleton cursor package table. So the skeletons, we have to take an X, which means you're gonna have to drain them, but it's not, an, it's not a rebind. So not that disruptive, but we do have to get a lock. So do it at a quiet time. And then at the bottom, change your ZPARMs to get those defaults to where you really want it. You know, where do you want all your standard tables and indexes to be? And where do you want lob and XML and that kind of stuff? Um, Adrian. Next one. Uh, Adrian, Go ahead. I've yeah. got a, a question here Go ahead. Uh, from Robert. It says, gotcha. are, are there negative effects if mixing uh, lobs and non-lob table spaces in a buffer pool in a non-data sharing environment? So, uh, yes, there is. You can still get the still get the table space growth, um, but you do at least you don't have to worry about the communication with the SCA structure there. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, thanks, and questions are certainly welcome as we go. I tend to speed up um, with less questions, so it's a little bit difficult doing a webinar where I can't get distracted as easily. So the next one is parameters. This is more for completeness. These can all be easily Googled and they haven't really changed over time. BP size, how many buffers you're gonna put in there. Um, SP size is somewhat new, came out in version 11, and this is when we talk about buffer pool simulation. So I'll get to that a little bit later. BP sequential, we'll go into this in depth uh, about tuning as well as VD, WQT. BP sequential is your sequential steel threshold. So that means if you've got that many, that percent of your buffer pool is filled with sequentially accessed pages, then we end up stealing sequential buffers before random. And I, I'll show you some visuals later, so I don't wanna get caught up with that now. Deferred write, if this many pages are dirty or in use, I'm gonna start trying to write them out to disk. Vertical deferred write, if this percent of pages belong to one data set, I'm gonna to try to write it out. And then page steal. So this is your, basically how the buffer pool operates as far as pushing pages out to disk. So none is an in-memory buffer pool, which uh, had great benefits in 10, even more benefits in 11, and in 12, uh, we've seen some great CPU savings by having buffer pool, page steel none buffer pools, which basically means you've got every object in there frozen in memory. We generally use the LRU or least recently used page steel algorithm, um, and then MRU is one for utilities, which is the most recently used. So this is kind of behind the scenes. The last bullet down here with the asterisk, I'm gonna go and give you a recommendation for work file buffer pools. So this is our conservative methodology. You want the sequential steel threshold between 90 and 95%. Why not 100? We've got things like sparse index access. And if you happen to have DGTTs mixed in with your sort work files, then you can get into trouble if that number is any higher. Same with deferred and vertical write thresholds. These are certainly higher than you'd have in any other buffer pool. And the reason they're not up in the 80 or 90% here is because most customers don't have 100% separation of the DGTTs and the standard sort work file. So this is a conservative approach to make sure that you don't run into the, any of the critical thresholds in the buffer pools. 
by having too many dirty pages. Next one for the deferred right. So we would prefer you to hit the vertical deferred right more often than deferred. We really want the vertical deferred to be the one that toggles pages out of the buffer pool. Deferred right is kind of a, call it a safety mechanism or something that's invoked at times of very high concurrent updates. Why? The DBT only schedules at the buffer pool level, it only schedules 128 pages to be written out at a time, and those have to go out in chunks of four IOs. So now we're talking 32 pages at a time can be written to disk. And behind the scenes, they have to be in the range of 180 buffers in the pool. Why that range? Well, because we don't want to take too many locks or latches within the buffer pool to ensure we've got page coherency when they go out. So it's a lot less likely that you're going to have 32 pages within that window if you're hitting deferred right, because deferred is for the whole pool and it's across every object in there. So much more likely you'd have 32 pages of the same object that are being, you know, within that same window and hence vertical deferred is more likely going to write out more dirty pages more efficiently than hitting deferred. The other one is deferred write tries to get you about 10% below the threshold you set. So he's going to go more aggressively and try to prune those pages out, whereas vertical deferred just goes down until his threshold is met. So here's the first customer scenario. So starting in 10, we fixed the root page of all the indexes in the buffer pool. So at first access, we fixed the root. Why? Because you got to go through the root page every time you do an index traversal. So we fixed that page. And then we ran into a customer in Europe who had incredibly small buffer pools. They were very conservative about deploying the storage. So just for the sake of argument, I'm going to say they got 10,000 buffers, which is probably more than they really had. If they set a deferred right of 30%, and there's a thousand indexes in that buffer pool, you've effect effectively dropped deferred right to 20%, just doing the math. So now I've only got 8,000 buffers that can actually hold you know, dirtier in use pages. So when this customer did this and they had an application change and they started using the buffer pool more, they were hitting the deferred right threshold 80 times a second, which in and of itself, you wouldn't really notice. We don't have a clip level. But looking in statistics report, in the latch class, I could see latch class 23 going at about 40,000 latches a second. Anything over 10 should always be investigated. And this brought you know, some serious scrutiny down. The application response times were dying on the vine because they were all IO bound. We're also burning a lot of CPU in DBM1 trying to manage this latch contention. Latch class 14 is also gonna go up aside from this latch class 23 because he holds the total LRU chain. So that's going to go up as well as these root pages get added. So in this customer environment, to get out of this sort of critical situation, they ended up just doubling the VP size for simplicity. They could have fiddled with deferred right, but in such a small pool, trying to push that up to not be hit could get you in worse trouble later on, depending on the, the frequency of the rights. So the end goal here is to ensure that you got enough headroom you only hit deferred write on occasion, and that vertical deferred write is really managing those pages being written out to disk. Speaking of those key thresholds to avoid, starting at the bottom of the slide, we got prefetch first. And this is reported in the stats, so you'll know if you hit it, it will say prefetch disabled, no buffer. And there's other reasons prefetch can be disabled, and we'll talk about that in a further slide. But basically this means you get 90% of the pages are dirtier in use. And at that point, we turn off prefetch, which means you end up doing a lot more sync IO. There's another key down here um, that I'll reference in a, in a later slide about IO parallelism. So you'll want to avoid that because obviously sync IO is slower and more CPU intensive. The next threshold is a data management threshold. That's at 95%. This is also reported in stats, thankfully, under the DM threshold topic. Check it at page writer update, uh, excuse me, reader update. And the CPU burn here comes in that we do a get page and a release page, it's about a thousand instructions, for every row we touch. So you've got hundred rows in the table, we're gonna do hundred get release pages because we wanna make sure we give the page a chance to be written out if it needs to. The last and most hideous one is the immediate write threshold. And we don't report this specifically in statistics. So this is at 97.5% the pages are dirty. 
What it means is after every update, we do a sync write to DASD. So you can imagine how painful that would be if you've got multiple rows on a page and each row you're writing, writing the page to DASD, reading it back in with an IO and trying to update the next row. How do I know it's happening then? We will see the DM threshold non-zero because you'll hit this first. And then you also see your number of sync writes reported in stats go up drastically. Sync writes normally do occur. If the, there's a dirty page in the pool for more than two system checkpoints, we're going to sync write it out. But this number is going to be vastly larger than zero um, if you get in this case where you hit this threshold. Okay, that was kind of the precursor stuff. Now we're getting right in the tuning part. First one, residency time. Why residency time? Well, this is the strategy that, that our team and some in level two use as a rule of thumb or an easy metric to compare because it's easy to compare across buffer pools and even across customers sometimes. Um, as a general rule of thumb for any buffer pool tuning, Historically, we've always tried to protect the random pages. Randomly accessed pages are important to us. Why? Because the application went after them specifically. If it's a prefetched page, then you may have gotten some other garbage in there that you didn't need. But if it's a sync IO, we know that you touched it randomly because you needed the rows on that page. So why discount hit ratios? Well, there's several types, um, random, sequential, and I guess system. And although many of the vendor tools and, and some other folks um, you know, in the performance industry might look at these, they're okay for buffer pool kind of before and after, or to see a trend if maybe an access path changed and you got a worse hit ratio. But it's very hard from a higher level perspective. And you also have to be aware that it changes across release boundaries. So between 10 and 11, your hit ratio may change drastically due to classification of get pages. So there's an inherent discrepancy before 11 of how we classify get pages versus buffers. So the get page is a logical, I need this page. The buffer classification is how that buffer, how that page went into the buffer pool. Was it randomly accessed, meaning it's a sync IO, or is it sequentially accessed via a prefetch? So prior to version nine, a get page that resulted in dynamic or list prefetch was considered random. Nitinoid fact. Who cares? Well, if I look in the random hit ratio calculation, it's total random get pages minus sync pages read. Well, if my get page created a, a prefetch scenario, it doesn't count against me because it wasn't synchronous. It's a prefetch. So hence my random hit ratio could be quite inflated prior to version 11. So in version 11, we fix our classification, the differences there, as well as this, that, that last get page that resulted in a prefetch goes in this counter. So now we're going to adjust it correctly. Other notes, sequential hit ratio can be negative. So trying to compare negative numbers across in a percentage is a little difficult. And we obviously get those because we brought in more pages via prefetch than we actually needed. More pages than the, the application could even consume. So here's our calculation for residency time. It's basically the total size divided by pages read per second. And that's going to be sync and async. So it's certainly not the residency time of every page. It's an average across the whole pool. So it may not even be the pages you really want to keep in there, but I say that it's easy to compare across pools. And this is how we use it. Our rule of thumb, arbitrary, somewhat identified by John Campbell, is about 60 seconds. So if we pull some data out of your customer environment on the right side, we're going to compare buffer pools and see the residency time. And here's our uh, chart basically breaking out which residency time that, that we're most concerned with. And obviously, anything less than 10 seconds is a pretty short turnaround. Buffer pool 10, right? We've got several minutes worth. Um, about half of the day, he doesn't even have a 10 second residency time. Buffer pool 11 has an infinite residency, meaning he's doing very few IOs. So if I'm going to steal from Peter to pay Paul, this looks like a good scenario. When we're doing this tuning, if I start with a 30 second residency time and I double the number of buffers and I get 60 seconds, I didn't win much, did I? That's a one for one. What I really look at is if I double the number of buffers or I try to, <clears throat> well, double the number of buffers, I want to aim for a residency time that's much higher than double. If I started with 30 seconds, 
and I end up with 90 seconds or you know, a minute and a half of residency, then we've got some in incremental performance gains. We've made a difference. Now, there is no magic number for residency. Like I said 60 seconds is a, a rule of thumb, but it's certainly good in understanding the ratio. Moving on, buffer pool simulation. So this came out in version 11 in conversion mode. I've just got one slide on it here. I'm not going to go into the details about turning it on and off, but some high level. The CPU overhead is negligible between 1% and 3%, and we assume you're going to tune one pool at a time. We're not going to try to simulate the entire environment. So negligible if you're doing it a pool at a time. There's a storage cost for simulation. Why? Because we're using the old hyperpool code. So we're actually putting control blocks in memory to track the usage of buffers and to understand when you could avoid an I.O. It's about 2% for 4K uh, pages, and it's even less percent for the larger pages. My SP size is going to control um, my simulated size, and my SP sequential will cover my simulated sequential steel threshold. And then I can see the results in my display buffer pool command as well as my statistics report. So I'm looking over here. I can see how many sync IOs I avoided, async IOs, and even write or read from the group buffer pool. So why do I really care if I'm avoiding a read from the group buffer pool? And we're talking about microseconds here. Well, remember, synchronous reads from the group buffer pool means you're spinning the general purpose CP on my primary LPAR while I synchronously go out and get the page from the group. So in this case, it may only be 10 to 20 something microseconds, but those are all CPU seconds. And then of course, if you can avoid a sync read, we're talking in the order of you know, 20 to 70 mics. Um, a CPU time avoided by doing the sync, uh, by avoiding the sync I.O. Then we'll also show you the sync I.O. delay time in milliseconds you could avoid by enlarging this pool. Just remember that the simulated size is the simulated size you're increasing the pool. It's not, if you have 100,000 buffers and you say simulate 100,000, you're now simulating a 200,000 buffer buffer pool. The other thing that I can't account for, I've had some customers come and say that it seems like our um, estimation here is grossly um, overly positive. And just remember, it doesn't account for cross-invalidated pages. Talk about cross-invalidation a little more, but basically if, if you've got pages that get changed in the group buffer pool and they get invalidated in your local pool, we don't really track that uh, in the simulation tool. Okay, another tuning mechanism. How about if kid 199 so the stats class 8 came out several releases ago lots of the tools use it so if you have a buffer pool tuning tool it probably asks you to turn on this stats trace what's it doing well once again it's a ne negligible cpu overhead i've had customers benchmark it for us and the average record size it writes out is about 2k so that'd be 2k a minute it's small because we lump 50 objects at a time into this record and it's only objects that do more than one IO a second. So the great thing here is I can have the stats on, I run my Omegamon report, I get it in the CSV or comma delimited file, and I can stick it into a spreadsheet and then do some graphing or pivot tables against it. So in my example here, um, I've broken it down. I've got a couple table spaces broken out, this TS202. I see he's doing 20% of the get pages during this interval against this buffer pool. If I then compare that against sync IO and async IO, he's doing 80% of the sync IOs. So why is he doing so much more proportionally than his size? Well, he's either an enormous table, maybe a couple terabytes that can never fit in storage, and you're doing random selections from each partition. Or you're right at a turning point in the buffer pool where adding you know, a couple mega storage may actually influence him. So if I'm trying to do some tuning, maybe I add some storage to this pool run the stats for the same interval the next day and see if I've reduced his IO. Why is that cool? Well, aside from worrying about the whole buffer pool here, I can match this back to specific packages and plans. And then I know that I'm actually saving CPU time against whatever dependent packages are on this table. So you can really get into the application tuning world here. The other example here is this table space 204. He's only doing 3% of the get pages, which is you know three and a half million. But down here in the I.O., he doesn't even show up. So maybe this guy is a good candidate for a page deal non-buffer pool. 
Maybe I can put him in create a page shield none buffer pool, dump the objects that I don't CIO against, and then get some extra CPU savings on top of them already being in memory. We're actually saving CPU in the buffer pool itself. Uh, Adrian, I've got yes, another. Go I've got another question for you from Jose. Uh, is it is it good practice to use a high resident high residency time with a high hit ratio to decide uh, uh, when to reduce the buffer pool size? Ah, so reducing the buffer pool size. I mean, it's hard to say when because you're you're going to lose some performance no matter what. But yes, a very high residency and a very high high hit ratio are certainly good indicators that um, that he's comfy. So if you take you know a couple of meg away from him to give to somebody else, then that could be helpful. Um, the downside is the only way to test that is to physically remove the storage. Um, we can't simulate, for instance, making anything smaller. So you're really just going to have to go with your gut. Um, of having, you know, almost no IOs, or the IOs are only against tables that would never fit in memory, and you know, you, use your best judgment. Okay, thanks. And we have another question just popped in, uh, popped up while I was answering that uh, from Russell, and he says you are talking about IO, but also uh, showing get pages. Get pages and IO are not the same thing. We'll oh, we'll always have get pages, uh, but. Reducing I/O is CPU savings. That's what he's written. So I'm, exactly. Let me try to make sense of that. If you can, okay. Yeah. Exact. Yes. Exactly. So he's completely right. The, the get pages are logical. I/Os are a physical I/O out to the DASD. Um, so I'm in this in this chart, for instance. I was comparing get pages of how intense this guy is going after this object, and then in the I/O, I'm trying to see if I can contain him in the buffer pool. So very valid point. Good. Okay. Thanks. Gen generally, generally speaking, though, if if I have more get pages against an object, I'm going to end up with more I/O unless he's contained in memory. That's right. Yeah. So the next one, VP sequential. So I'm going to go through a couple of slides here, and you're going to learn more, hopefully, than you ever wanted to know about the sequential steel threshold. So here's a customer. He's monitoring his display buffer pool. He's looking at I/Os. He goes from one version to another, from eight to nine, he sees a 30% increase. Oh no, what's going on here? Well, what's sequential steel threshold doing? In my example down here, I've got one sequentially accessed buffer, so he was brought in via prefetch, and I've got some other buffers that were randomly accessed. They were brought in via sync IO. So if I get a sequential steel threshold of 20 here, in my example, I just got one buffer that's sequential. So I'm in this state now, I'm at 20% of my buffers are sequential. So the next time I got to steal a buffer for some other page coming in, I'm going to steal sequential first. And once I've exhausted them or drop below this threshold, then I'll steal random. So the whole idea of BP sequential is to protect your randomly accessed pages. So this customer went from one version to another, realized that for some reason there's a lot more pages on the sequential steal threshold now. Why is that? Well, we changed how we classified buffers. In version nine and 10, we changed it. So where if we were, we brought in a bunch of pages sequentially via prefetch, if they were later touched by another application or touched in a random fashion, we used to reclassify them. That was in version eight and prior, and then version 11 and up, we'd reclassify. In version nine and 10, we did not reclassify. So he ends up in a scenario on the right where he's got a very low sequential seal threshold to protect random pages, but these pages are brought in sequentially, and when they're retouched, that's why I've got an R in here, they aren't reclassified. The buffer is still classified as sequential, and hence they can be stolen earlier. So VP sequential says, if I'm in this threshold, I'm going to steal sequential buffers first. So what else, what does this look like from his specific scenario? This is a timeline. So in here I'm in version 8. Goes to version nine, 20% increase in IO. What changed? We talked to the developers and we said, well, to soften the blow, let's increase your VP sequential. So he'd had VP sequential very low. Why? To protect random pages. Why? Because this customer is in finance. And the way their applications work is they go after, for instance, a portfolio. And it'll have a whole bunch 
of different stocks and bonds and so on under it. And when they bring that in and prefetch, they go back and retouch many of those individual pages and update or select from those. So they prefetch in a bunch and then access them multiple times. So increasing VP sequential helped because we just allowed more of the sequential pages in there and they weren't being reclassified. Then we gave them a fix to go back to version eight. Sounds strange, right? But we gave them the version eight code for this specific scenario. Increase or vastly improved his response time and he dropped the number of IOs. Then finally, with that fix on, he went back and dropped VP sequential down to his previous number so that he could compare apples to apples. So in version 11, don't worry, you're in the same scenario over here where we classify the pages correctly as they come in. And then if you have sequential buffers that are touched again or re-referenced, we reclassify them to random and hence they're more protected. So I'm gonna go on and we'll circle back to VP sequential in just a minute. And all this, this takes quite a bit to kind of go through and, and internalize. So talking about sequentially accessed pages, what's my worst fear? Well, it's sync read sequential. A sync IO for sequentially accessed page means I prefetch the guy in and then that buffer was stolen before my application could consume it. And hence I got to do another sync IO. Well, that's no good. It's one IO for the price of two. Doesn't sound very good. So my example over here, the red is sync sequential IO, blue is random. I'm anywhere from one third to two thirds of sync sequential IO. So all these represent two IOs where I could have gotten away with just one. Hence you're increasing elapsed time and CPU for the application. What's the answer? Well, as with everything, bigger is better. Increase the size or alter the VP sequential. And the rule of thumb here, at a minimum, is your VP size times VP sequential should be greater than or equal to 320 meg and actually 450 meg in version 12. What's this getting me? It doesn't eliminate all of the sync read sequential, but it does ensure that I'm at the most, um, well, it, it, it allows me uh, the maximal, maximum prefetch concurrency, meaning if all my prefetch engines light up at the same time and they happen to be going in this buffer pool, then they'll get the maximum prefetch quantity. So this is the minimum, and if I want to reduce these, I'm going to have to tune VP sequential a little more. So what if I decided to do that? So here's my favorite customer again. They're at VP sequential of 10%, meaning if 10% of my buffers in there were sequentially accessed, the next time I steal a buffer, I'm going to go after the sequential ones because I'm trying to protect those random guys. So he went from 10 up to 80% of VP sequential. Why? Well, to tune away those sync IO sequentials, to tune this red out, he wants to increase VP sequential, which is one, one of the two correct methods. He wants to align with a IBM defaults, um, and then he wants to play with these new stats that he found starting in version 11, which is how often we went through VP sequential, the threshold, and when we reclassify buffers. These two are sort of arbitrary. He just wanted to see what tuning knobs fixed it. So he made this change and he sent me some numbers and he said, look at this, my sync IO sequential went down from before and after. I said, yes, you saved about a million IOs with that change. Unfortunately, your random, your sync IOs went up a net of about 6 million. So this tune, same VP size, but moving from 10 to 80% sequential, now the random IO is increased by 6 million. Why is that? When he increased it, he's now going to allow three and a half million buffers in there that are sequential. This resulted in a bunch more reclassification. Reclassification is when I bring the buffer in sequentially, I access it randomly once it's already in there, and we reclassify it so that it's on the random LRU chain. Well, we had to reclassify 12 million more of these guys because there were so many sequential buffers, there wasn't enough for those random pages that I really need. I go back to the description of this guy's workload. It's prefetch in a whole bunch of pages and I'm gonna go in and re-reference a subset of those. So it was too high to protect the random and hence I get a whole bunch more random IO, right? 
sync read IO goes up substantially. Sync read for sequential goes down. Summary, he could have used the simulation method. He would have had to add buffers in the simulation and then change the SP sequential of those additional, or probably pick somewhere in the middle. Instead of 10 to 80, maybe incrementally go 20, 30, 40. At some point, you get to the sweet spot where sync sequential goes down and your random IO stays the same or goes down. So once you start increasing random IO, you've gone too far. Um, Adrian, I've got a couple more questions. It's great Good. to see the questions coming in. Um, is V11 classification changed in uh, com uh, conversion or in uh, new function mode? It's in conversion mode in CN. Yeah, I thought it was, yeah. Um, will there be any discussion on how best to buffer table spaces that contain hashed tables? Ooh, so I left that one out, and I'm not sure if that was intentional. Probably. There is, <laughs> to be brutally honest, there is a small subset of customers using hash. So please, by all means, email me. Um, shoot me a question, and, and let's tackle that one a little separately. Fair enough. Good. Thank you. The, the short answer is that thing is only going to have random access. So it's kind of hard to tune because the thing should never have sequential access. And if it does, then it shouldn't be a hash table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Sure. Sure>. <laughs> um, so async IO, this uh, some goodness. Index IO parallelism. We didn't promote it, I don't think, a whole lot in 10, but it means if you got more than two indexes on a table, DB2 will detect, i.e. buffer manager is going to detect sync IO delay. When he sees that and he knows you've got more than two indexes on a table, he's going to send off prefetch engines to go get those other index lease pages so that we can update them in parallel, so to speak. So instead of waiting for one to come in and the next and the next, we're going to wait for one and then say, oh, there's a delay, send my prefetch engines out. So I'm sorry for the colors. These are the original colors. Um, so we're dropping the elapsed time down drastically, and we're trading CPU for zip time because the prefetch engines are zippable. So we add some zip CPU, and we drop the elapsed time quite a bit. There's some traces you can look at. The defining characteristic is if in your index buffer pool, you see a bunch of sequential prefetch. It wouldn't happen normally because we don't use sequential prefetch against indexes unless we're doing this scenario. So you'll see sequential prefetch pages read per prefetch equals one. That means we're using this mechanism to bring in your index uh, to avoid sync IO delay. If you've played with virtual parallel sequential steel threshold, VPPSEQT, or set VPSEQT to zero, either of these, you've disabled this feature and you will get prefetch disabled no buffer in your stats because of this alone. So if I see this and it's in an index only buffer pool, where there's only indexes in there, I'm gonna go hunting to see if you've turned this off. So it's not as bad. It doesn't mean 90% of your buffers are dirtier in use. You haven't hit the actual prefetch threshold. It just means that you've disabled this and you're missing out on some elapsed time savings. Next one. I think this is the softest, most softly advertised performance enhancement of version 12, and it could be huge for you. So we added prefetch engines. So if you have prefetch disabled no read engine in prior releases, this could help unless your CPU, or excuse me, unless you're zip constrained, in which case it will make it worse. But we've added prefetch engines because we know sometimes 600 aren't enough in today's enormous subsystems. The other thing that we've done, this is a key, we've reduced or removed unnecessary prefetch. So if you look at dynamic prefetch requests versus dynamic prefetch IO in your stats, you may see a huge difference. In this example, it's 70 to one. So here I asked for prefetch, here I executed prefetch. Why is it so different? Well, the prefetch engine is sent out or prior to the get page and the prefetch engine goes out to see if those pages you asked for are already in the pool or not. So we launch a prefetch engine, he says, oh, pages are all resident, I don't need a prefetch IO. So then he goes back to sleep. But these burn zip cycles. And if you don't have zips, they're burning general purpose cycles. So if the first three don't 
actually result in a, in a prefetch IO, then we disable prefetch for that thread and that object. So great, we save zip cycles. Other thing we save is latch class 24, as well as read IO delay. Latch class 24 we've seen in recent years has come up drastically. That's where I've got, for instance, two threads trying to invoke dynamic prefetch going after the same table. In this case, they got 250,000 latch class 24 contentions per second, and it's all zip eligible work. So what they did is they end up using eight zips, this eight CPU seconds per second. So they used eight zips for the course of several hours because of this contention. The only way to tune this out is to avoid prefetch workloads overlapping. That's prefetch going after the same page, same data page. So you either have to tune your workloads or get to version 12. Easier said than done, right? So next section, P close N and T. This will be the last brain buster. Um, so P close N and T govern the frequency of pseudo close. What pseudo close? If you've got objects that are group buffer pool dependent, if the read or write interest goes away, then you've only got basically one system accessing it anymore. The page pseudo closes or goes out of group buffer pool dependency and just remains in the local buffer pool. If it goes through two cycles of checkpoints or the time, then we'll physically close it. We only physical close objects that are defined as closed yes. So we got two camps. We get the closed yes camp and the closed no camp. Some customers, most today, have a mix of yes and no, but some are starchly on one side or the other. The positives, close no allows you to keep the objects open longer. You avoid physical open and close overhead. There's very little overhead after version 11. You probably could measure the, the overhead of opening um, a data set before this, but not now. There's also less syslog, syslog range X entries because we have to log it every time it opens and closes. So this saves, could potentially save some overhead or elapsed time. Close yes means I'm always gonna close the objects and they could end up physically closing. What does that give you? A shorter recovery time. If DB2 crashes during the online day and all your objects are closed no, you could have tens of thousand objects stuck in GREC PLPL. So this is, close yes is a recovery statement. So what does this do in production? So in version 10, we added a mechanism to avoid local buffer pool scans. So what does that do for us? We're gonna save DBM1 CPU time. Based on our test scenarios, it was you know, in the range of 30 to 50% probably, saving DBM1 SRB time. Because when an object transitions in or out of group buffer pool dependency, we used to scan all the local pools, look for those pages and cross and validate them. After version 10, now we just simply cross that data set out. So when it comes in or out of group buffer pool dependency, we mark it invalid, all the local pages become invalid. So we save SRB time, but if you were an application accessing those pages, you now had to go out and do it, well, basically pull the page back in from DASD. So here's customer scenario, went from nine to 10. I know these are dated uh, as far as the versions, but there are still people on version nine. So just so you understand the difference here. In version nine, they were looking at read XINO data. So my page was cross invalidated in the local pool. I went to the group buffer pool, it wasn't there either. I had to go to DASD. So not that many in nine. In these two group buffer pools in 10, now I've got 16,000 invalidations and 24,000. So these represent actual IOs I had to do to DASD. So why did this change across the release? Well, one is that we added this mechanism. So we cross and validate all the pages when it goes out of group buffer pool dependency. In this customer though, the reason it intensified is that they had fiddled with P close T, so the pseudo close time interval. They went with our default again, which, you know, as we've learned before, DB2, in general, DB2 defaults may not always be the best for your environment. So when they lowered this number, they increased the number of data sets that were converted read, write, read only. So this is the number of data sets that pseudo closed. Our rule of thumb, once again, John Campbell special, 10 to 15 a minute. In this example here, they were doing, you know, 60 to 70 up to over 100 per minute. So they were already above the rule of thumb in nine and in 10, it exacerbated. 
So the solution to this scenario, to avoid most of these cross validated pages, is to disable the pclose for checkpoints and bump the pclose time up until we saw a, <clears throat> a significant drop in, in um, cross validation. At this customer, we put it at 45, and we know that 30 minutes was the magic number because get in the weeds, they had one application that every 30 minutes came in and read, scanned through an entire index. And then 30 minutes, <clears throat> if P close T was less than 30 minutes, we'd pseudo close that object, we cross and validate all the local pages, and then that application would have to read in the whole index again when it came back. So disabling P close in and bumping this up is not everybody's solution, but I'd be curious if you tested the pclose t time to see if it influenced how the number of cross and validations and the number of IOs you had to do to that. So this alone, you know, affected the number of IOs across the entire subsystem. Okay, last section, just a couple of slides. Sorry for running over. At the top here, we may be looking at your scenario. You either got a whole bunch of little objects trying to get in a very small pool, or you're the only one and you got tons of storage. We'll see where we are. So here's an example, we're talking about buffer pools and auxiliary storage. So if my buffers, my physical storage in the buffer pools, those frames are paged out to aux, bad news, right? We see <clears throat> examples of the control blocks as well as the storage itself being pushed to aux. So how do I know if my buffer pools are paging? Well, I see it in sync IO, buffer pool hit ratio, residency time. I want you to think really loud so I can hear you. No. If my buffer pool is paging, the only effects I'll be able to tell, <clears throat> only way to investigate is if the storage, if kid 225, which I have here, looking at a paging report in RMF, class two not accounted, right, which is gonna eventually increase elapsed time as well, or is the US captured for paging? How come it's only in here, not here? Well, <clears throat> if, we, if the buffer pools page to auxiliary storage, that's a physical, it's a physical activity. Buffer manager is only aware of the logical side. He says, I, I wanna bring this page into memory. Okay, I've got Adrian's page in memory. If ZOS comes along and steals it for somebody else, he gives that frame of storage to Kix, for instance. If I come back and access my Adrian page again, it's gonna to have to go to DASD, go to the Ox page, let's bring it back in. I didn't know there was an IO. Buffer manager didn't know that because it's all under the covers. So this, Paging out to auxiliary for buffer pools is very painful because if you're just a buffer, if you're just a DB2 guy, you may not even know what's going on. The one that you know is bad news is this page ins for read or page ins for write. That means DB2 went back to the end of the LRU chain. He said, I'm going to steal a buffer because um, Martin needs Adrian's page. So I'm going to steal a buffer. And when he went there, there was no frame of real storage because ZOS stole it for kicks. So then he has to page in a frame of storage and then he's got to page in Martin's page over mine. So it's kind of two steps in there. That's what shows up here. If I want to go after my Adrian page and someone's stolen me, this doesn't show up. It's only when the buffer pool steals its own buffers from Peter for Paul that this number is incremented. So if this is showing up, you probably are paging if there's anything over VP size. In this example, the VP size is a thousand, and this is 19,000 times. This is wrapped around in an hour. So this this entire buffer pool has been paged in and out 19 times. The other thing you want to take into account, obviously, is storage for dumps. Unfortunately, sometimes this can happen in the middle of the online day. So how do you calculate your dump size? Here's a simple equation for you. Remember with PI 85053, we don't dump the control blocks anymore. They're only about one eighth of the size of the buffer pool, but eliminating those in you know, a several hundred gigabyte buffer pool can be very helpful. We never dump the buffers in the buffer pool, but we used to dump the control blocks until this came out. Okay, new feature function version 12, <coughs> excuse me, version 11. Um, auto size, it was retro to 10. Auto size yes says WLM is gonna look and see if I'm, if, got, if I'm 
<clears throat> my applications, right, or my service class is waiting on IO delay. If he is, he has the option to increase the buffer pools plus or minus 25%. Well, customer scenario, they implemented auto science on all buffer pools. They had page fix, yes. So when it came in, it was fixed in storage. This LPAR at about you no know, one o'clock in the afternoon hit 80% of the LPAR's total size at 20 gig. At this point, if you page fix 80% of your LPAR, ZOS will take action against you. And in this case, he made DBM1 address space non-dispatchable. So all work in DB2 stopped. The only way to get around this is they had to bounce DB2, bring it up in main, unpage fix the buffer pools, and recycle. Very painful. So key, don't ever allow anything to page fix 80% of your LPAR. Be on the ZOS 2.1 and set min and max size, which came in with version 11. So that's a way to constrain the total number of, um, well, the amount of storage that auto science has control of, so that you don't get yourself in trouble. Another look at auto size. If you have it turned on, WLM doesn't really have a long-term memory of this. It's every five minutes he does an analysis and says, oh, sync IO delay, he could probably use more buffers. So my customer example, BP15 follows during the online day, he's got a nice curve. This makes sense. Online transactions come in, they diminish, batch, my size goes back down. That's kind of what this is designed for. These other guys can be very erratic. So the negative is that they're taking up storage. And if I look at my total storage um, on the LPAR over here, this guy is varying up to 60 gigabytes in a couple of minutes. So if I'm varying that much other things like DS sort, sync sort, so on, are having to contend with a whole bunch of other contention for storage. So you're kind of fighting against each other. The other negative of the drastic changes is that the applications executing in this buffer pool are feeling this, right? You went in, you know, 10 minutes ago, I could fit my entire table space in memory, and now I can only fit one partition. So these applications are gonna have varying response times based on the storage allocation. So while out of size is trying to, you know, instantaneously improve this, over time, it kind of loses its effectiveness. So what's our recommendation for that? Use the min and max size. Get your allowance for real storage. So say you've got 20 gig. Set the difference between min size and max size at 20 gig across your buffer pools. As far as the sum <laughs> is 20 gig. And that'll allow WM to work within your constraints. You want to choose a good period of the day and a consistent period to monitor what the changes are. It's going to change between online and batch. Do you want to do this two separate intervals? That's fine. Just compare apples to apples. And for the change, once you see what WM is doing and you see the pattern, you can affect that by an online alter for that buffer pool and maybe do it at those two intervals during the day. So eventually you want to take it out of WM's hands and you want to do the ultra buffer pool so that you have a static controllable environment. White space is still important for other sort work and dump. And do remember that if you're going to increase or do anything with the size of the local buffer pools, you need to go and take care of the group buffer pools as well. XCS auto alter is not going to be able to catch up with this auto size by any means. So you want to reset those guys for knit size and size, reset your baseline after you've stabilized the local buffer pools. And with that, I've got one more slide on 12. Save the newest stuff to last because we're always waiting for more, app or excuse me, more customer feedback on this so that we know we're going in the right direction. So in 12, we continue trading. You give us real storage, we give you CPU savings. So the thread footprint is going to increase by about 20% due to a bunch of code enhancements. Hopefully, you'll get some CPU savings out of some different things, but mainly it'll be from storage. Seven byte RID, this allows us to have one terabyte LPARs, excuse me, one terabyte partitions. We had to make this change, it increases the usage in max R block, right? So your RID block, you're gonna increase that ZPARM. For fast reversal block, we're giving you a 45% get page reduction in times. Customers have even seen more. In exchange for your BP size, your buffer pools are going to, could increase by 20%. Contiguous, this is your page steel non buffer pools. We can save you 8% CPU, but it's going to cost you up to 6,400 buffers 
per buffer pool, right? And these only apply to your in-memory page steel non buffers. But in general, so we're going to keep giving you CPU savings if you give us real frames of storage. And of course, as always, page fix and using large frames in ZOS are a great CPU saver, and there's not that much tuning. Just fix them and then back them with the large frames. And with that, thank you very much. I apologize for going over past the hour. We got some references here, um, and certainly you can reach out uh, to me with any questions as my email address is in the presentation. Any more questions, Martin? Yes, one, one more, more question. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, one meg page sizes and page fixing? Yes, all good, unless you get overzealous and take over more storage than you have. So the, the page fixing is the biggest improvement um, in our development lab, and in some customers I've seen about 8% CPU savings. Mm -hmm. That's being across any workload that hits it. Right. So page fix first when you've got the storage, and then the, the incremental or the, the um, icing on top of it is the large frame where you allocate that large frame. You're basically reserving it from anybody else in the LPAR using it to use one meg or two gig frames. And it's very good. Just don't over allocate it because once you've allocated those large frames, it takes CPU if we have to break them down and give them back to our 4K friends. So okay. just make sure you don't over budget that. Good. Fantastic. That's the end of the question queue. And uh, it takes us to the uh, wrap up of the show here. Uh, just need to make myself the presenter and go over here and uh, go to the next page here. And uh, we have our last final question, as always, that we do, which is our, uh, uh, let me find it right here. And, uh, there it is right there. And did you learn something today? This is a question we always like to see. Uh, people respond uh, positively to. And uh, people are answering quickly because it must be lunchtime on the East Coast. Oh, my goodness, it is. And uh, with that, I will just share the result quickly and say that 100% of our studio audience learned something today, which is uh, always a number we love to see, and it's just an indication of just what a fine job you did, Adrian, and thank you so much for doing so. Hopefully it wasn't just about where your vacation was, but there was oh, definitely some information no, there no, I'm about sure it was, as well. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure it was all your stuff, uh, but, uh, but that's just fantastic. Okay, I'll close that off. I'll hide that back, and now we are uh, back to... Uh, wishing everyone a, uh, a uh, great weekend. Hopefully you're having some uh, good weather. Hopefully the people in uh, the Carolinas are safe and uh, things are going uh, okay there or as, as well or better than, than they expected. And uh, with that, uh, I'll wish everyone a good weekend. I will cue the music and, and uh, we'll, call that a, we'll call that a wrap. Thanks, Thanks everyone, so much, Martin. For joining Thanks everybody Thanks for showing again, up. Thanks again, Adrian. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next DB2 Night Show.